Okay, we went to the top of the mountain with Conrad, and now we're going to talk about the bottom line with Stuart and Jonathan. We're going to talk about money. Most of what we're talking about here at the conference this week, we can't accomplish any of this cool technology we're going to be talking about in a lot of sessions without financing. So one of our sustainable solutions sessions is going to be how to double clean tech financing. And uh, we're going to be digging into that tomorrow, but let's get the conversation started. Stuart, um, a couple of years ago, uh, Goldman Sachs, um, where you are the, the global head of venture capital coverage and clean technology and renewables group, um, got a lot of attention when you said that you plan to invest $40 billion in clean tech over the following decade, and you compared the sector to information technology in the late 90s. Uh, so first of all, I want to ask you, are you going to reach that target? That sounded like a big target, and are you on track? The short answer is yes. We, uh, just in the last two years, have invested or financed $13 billion of that $40 billion target. Um, and to put it in perspective, we had set actually a prior target in 2005 to invest or finance a billion and uh, actually executed 23 billion. So I think we'll, we'll uh, achieve that handily. Mm -hmm. uh, comparing it to information technology in the late 90s sounds like you know, something that's going to spawn great riches. I mean, you know, we had a, a, a tech bubble in the late 90s, but it's re we've recovered from the bubble and great fortunes have been made. I mean, do you see that kind of thing happening in clean tech investing? Well, the analogy actually was to the early 90s, but the point was that there will be tremendous volatility, uh, and we've already seen it in renewables, just as we saw great volatility in technology through the 90s and 2000 with uh, periods of rapid growth and uh, wealth creation and then a collapse of that. Um, in our own sector, while uh, 2010, 11, 12 were pretty rough, uh, if you were an investor in Tesla or in SolarCity or Solazyme or a number of other companies that have done extraordinarily well, you've done, you've done quite well and that will, um, I think, attract more capital. Great. Um, Jonathan, you're the co-founder and CEO of Solazyme. Um, you also have a, a background in, in economics and, and policy. Uh, from all of those perspectives, I'm wondering, a, a few months ago, 60 Minutes ran a piece called The Clean Tech Crash, arguing that Washington and Silicon Valley have invested billions in this area and have little to show for it. And as somebody who's running a business in this area and with your background, I mean, what was your reaction to that, first of all? I, you know, I think that the first thing, I actually watched it in my, in my living room with my wife next to me, and I, I waited. I, it was hard for me to stay silent for the whole uh, uh, airing. At the end of it, I turned to her and I said, okay, now's the time to go along. When 60 Minutes proclaims the death of an industry, it's the time to go along. I, th I think, you know, you could get a little bit deeper into that, and, uh, and someone who they, they poked pretty hard in that was uh, Vinod Kosla, but uh, if you had an opportunity to read some of his response as well as others, I think uh, it was very opportunistically taking um, examples that were not representative writ large. And what I mean by that is clean tech itself is a difficult descriptor, what it really means. And it means but a lot of different things. clean tech crash is alliterative and catchy, so it's easy to... <laughs> but it means on. a lot of different things to different people. And I think ultimately, if you look at technologies that are providing better performance, better value propositions, and better sustainability, which is all around better, uh, there are many, many technologies that are both making money and improving our lives today. And, uh, and so to say that clean tech has crashed, I think it's just ridiculous. I'm sure that most of the people here know, are familiar with Solazon, but maybe you could just quickly explain what you do, what your business is, and then maybe you could talk about from your own perspective, your financing experience, you know, what, how you've experienced the financing environment. <laughs> well, the, 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 company's, the company Solazon, we make renewable oils, and we started the company solely to make oils for fuels, and we realized as we were amping up the ability to produce these oils, that if we were making oils, we could make oils for all the things they're used in. So everything from fuels to food to personal care to, uh, to lubricants and chemicals. And as you, you know, in Silicon Valley, one of the great things about being there, it's a place where people have a lot of respect for following the lead of the technology. 
And in our history, from a financing perspective, you know, we, we went for our first financing in 2003, and I could say that it's always about finding people who are, and I'll use this word again, playing the long game. If you find people who are thinking short term, it is guaranteed to be a bad match. And, and the other thing I'll say is we had the most success in financing with people who put the energy into breaking clean tech into pieces and understanding, it's like any other investing, you have to understand your markets, you have to understand how much money needs to be invested, you need to understand the timelines. And for instance, when venture capitalists follow clean tech writ large, like Lemmings, there's a lot of people getting burnt. But when people really specialize and differentiate, you can have very big wins. And, and that's something that we found, for instance, in working uh, with Stewart's team, they made a long-term investment and they had people who really were learning about the different areas and becoming specialists with committed equity research. I mean, just think about equity research. Think about what's happened to equity research over the last 10 or 15 years. And if you don't have good equity research and you don't have good capital markets, the funding will dry up on the other side at the beginning. And so these are the kinds of things we learned and these are the kinds of things that we think need to be pushed more. Mm -hmm. I want to remind everybody to get your questions ready. We'll, we'll look for audience questions in a minute. But um, Stuart, when you, similar to Jonathan, were you watching 60 Minutes and smiling, thinking like, this is great? I mean, on the Buffett principle of be uh, greedy when others are fearful and fearful when others are greedy, if, if everyone is down on clean tech, is that good for Goldman because there's better investment opportunities for you? Well, historically, we have been contrarian investors and found the best opportunities when others are fleeing the space. But I wasn't thinking that while I was watching that. I was, I was disappointed that 60 Minutes, which is a show I'd watched for decades, uh, didn't take a more thoughtful approach to that piece um, when there were so many other things they could have said. Mm -hmm. um, investment in clean tech broadly has been falling. But uh, as you pointed out when we were talking, I mean, there's big successes. There's Tesla. Solar City, Google buying Nest. Mm -hmm. I mean, so do you think that there's the perception just doesn't match reality? Um, and you know, how do you turn around sort of the clean tech image problem if it has one, or you know, or is that even important? Mm -hmm. Well, I think perception lags reality, and mm -hmm. I don't know if it's six months or twelve months or eighteen months, but that's always been the case. People were investing too long through 2007 and to 2008, and they got burned paying high valuations at the wrong time. And then they stopped investing exactly at the time when they should have uh, doubled down and, uh, and uh, become more aggressive. Uh, but ultimately, uh, the fundamentals will uh, be important. Uh, investors chase returns. And if you have success stories like the ones you just mentioned, O'Power just went public recently, all the investors in the stories that we've just discussed uh, have had really outsized returns. Um, new investors will be brought into the space as they find um, it to be pretty attractive. I mean, that raises sort of a big question. Uh, do we need to be brainstorming ways to double investment in clean tech, or is it going to happen naturally? Is money going to find opportunity? Is the opportunity going to be there on a big scale? Or do we need to you know, find a catalyst just because we can't afford to wait for that to happen? Well, I, I think it's a combination. Uh, it starts with great technology like uh, Solozymes, and so you need to be able to drive down the cost curve in whatever subsector you're in, whether it's electric vehicles or LEDs or, or uh, bioproducts. Um, it's helpful to have consistent policy. We really haven't had that uh, in this country. There's no energy policy, as we've discussed this morning or this afternoon. It'd be helpful to have that. Um, obviously, they're making movements on the in the executive branch, but not so much um, on the legislative branch. Um, and you know, if uh, companies are able to drive down the cost curve and become competitive with whatever the existing technologies that exist today, and they have better product, like Solozyme's products or or Tesla's electric vehicles, ultimately uh, they'll succeed. Jonathan, what do you think the role of government should be, could be, and, and boosting financing and will be? I mean, you know, from somebody running a business, what do you want to see and what do you think you're going to see? What are you planning around? Well, well, I think the first easy answer, you can really tier this. 
And if you start at the top with what you'd like it to be, um, I think that in the near term it won't be anything like what we'd like to see. Um, but if you just take some basic principles that sound like triteisms, but they're true, which is technology neutrality and a level playing field, there's a tremendous amount that just could happen at the top um, uh, really to help that. And if you really just look, and, and again, this is where the tritism comes true, but if you look at the development of the petrochemical industry, uh, most people don't know that the Department of Defense played a huge role in funding the development of the petrochemical industry. These industries have long timelines, large capital needs, and government, the US government, has always played a role in the dawn of every really truly important technology that's come around for a long time. Um, a very quick, uh, a very quick story. You know, we worked with the U.S. Navy for the span of about five years, starting in the first Bush administration. And the U.S. Navy was intent for perp for reasons that were brought up a couple panels ago on on energy security and climate change um, during a Republican administration to look for alternatives and to certify their whole fleet on a 50-50 blend. We worked with the Navy for five years. We were the benchmark fuel used across. The, uh, the marine fleet, the non-nuclear marine fleet, and at the conclusion, they ran an entire aircraft strike group on a 50-50 blend that included our fuels, and we ended up on the Bill O'Reilly show um, being lampooned for something that was, you know, in my opinion, a truly great American technology success story. Um, so I, I think that the reason I say that is because you have to reduce your perspective of what you want. The next tier, very quickly, I would say is just go for a true level playing field. And so in that bucket, I say forget investment tax credits or production tax credits. Just give me reserve accounting for fuel, like the fossil fuel guys have. If I have reserve accounting and I'm using energy cane, then let me put that on my balance sheet and finance my second plant, third plant, and fourth plant with that reserve, the same way a guy who's drilling in the back end can take his reserve and he can drill his second, third, and fourth well. And then the level below that is just do no harm. And that's where we spend most of our energy right now. Just trying to <laughs> avoid harm. Yes. Uh, let's open it up and see. I think we have a question back here. Please uh, identify yourself. Joel McCower at Greenbiz. I'm wondering whether part of the challenge here is that the term clean tech has sort of become meaningless um, in the last few years in the same way, because we don't really know what it means and it's become politicized that a lot of technologies, sensors and analytics and software that dramatically, radically improve efficiencies isn't clean tech. And because it's become so politi politicized, um, the same way, you know, we, we just, maybe we should start calling it something else. Maybe we should just call it tech, that energy tech or water tech or whatever the tech is. Um, is do you see that, why do we still need separate funds for clean, so-called clean technology? That's a good question. I mean, uh, I, I guess when there was enthusiasm, it was fun to call it, to label it something. But I mean, what do you call it internally at, at Goldman? Clean technology and renewables. <laughs> um, I, I don't think that's a problem. When we're, we're out raising capital for companies, uh, we're no longer just going to the clean tech investors. That bucket has gone from several dozen, dozen investors to two or three. Quite honestly, it's, it's almost dissipated. So we um, target technology investors or uh, energy investors or growth investors or small cap investors um, more broadly defined and, and people I think um, ignore the you know the title clean technology and focus on the underlying uh, technologies there, Joel, Joel I, I I'd just say I actually kind of agree with you I mean I I, I think you know uh, Goldman Sachs has been a great partner with us but as a practical matter uh, it, it Clean tech means so many things, and just to repeat something I said earlier, what are, it, it, it shouldn't mean being green as a label. It should mean being better. And I said it, you know, better products, better value proposition, and more sustainable. And that requires expertise in, in so many different areas that this overall moniker now isn't necessarily helpful. I don't think it's the anywhere near the top at the, of the list of things we need to change, but I definitely don't think it's particularly helpful. Yeah, but when the internet bubble burst in 2002, we didn't change <laughs> what that industry was called. It's fine today, and I think we'll get past it, you know, particularly with some of the successes we've seen recently. If we could just solve all our problems through labeling, then we are, you know, <laughs> right. we'd be fine. Right. We might have time for one more question. I don't know if we have anybody. Oh, one over here. This will be our last question. Yeah, Brian. This is for Stuart. Um, what's the 
next new exciting clean tech investment opportunity that we don't know about? Um, and how can Brian make money on it? Yeah, I <laughs> wish I had a funny response to that question. Look, I, I get excited every morning because every one of the subsectors, and Jonathan's right, they require you know understanding of physics and chemistry and a number of other um, uh, academic specialties. But you know, LEDs are interesting because I think lighting is changing, and people have heard me talk about a tipping point. The adoption of LEDs is happening more rapidly than anybody would have thought. Water, and I know there's a, a, a separate uh, panel here on water, uh, to me personally, is fascinating. I think it's as big an issue as energy, if not perhaps bigger. And there are a lot of companies that are focused on trying to uh, f find new sources of water, but also you know filtering water or conserving water, and those are all you know very very important. I think electric vehicles will continue to be uh, important. We've just just scratched the surface. I think there'll be mass adoption as the price points come down, and Tesla's third generation car, for example, $35,000 in a 200 mile range. You know, 35,000 is about what people pay for a, a Camry or a Taurus or a, a car like that. Uh, and I think there'll be mass adoption. So all, all of these things are exciting to us and we're, you know, pursuing each one aggressively. Okay, we've got to cut it off there in the middle, but that's good because we're saving our ammo for tomorrow's sustainable solutions session so bring your ideas and your questions and be ready to brainstorm and join me in thanking Stuart and Jonathan Thanks. okay now